Okay. All right. First of all, I cannot see you. Second of all, I don't like that you're talking to me like I'm a five year old and you're using your soft voice and you're How dare very I be patient. a producer. You're very patient. Speak with me. Like you, I, I don't. I'm not stupid. I'm not stupid. Well, I've heard bad things about, you know, how you deal with the stars. I've heard things about what you want in your dressing room and, you know, all your different candies and your different lotions. And it just is a bit creepy, but I'm trying my best to handle the ego without causing any issues. Well, speaking of lotions, move it. It's blocking the camera, whatever you were doing before you got here. So come on, let's go. I'm a panda, though. I thought that would be something you immediately do. Okay, fine. We'll just ignore that fact and we'll jump straight into it. Welcome everyone to Nick and Tom's Intercontinental Adventure on the PW Torch Daily Cast featuring myself, Tom Collihue, and my colleague Nick Barbati as we break down the world of wrestling. We've gone quite in depth recently on Triple H returns. We've talked CM Punk, we've talked Bray Wyatt. Today, we're going to be looking at Survivor Series because it's just a week away and by the time our show goes live next week, we will already be having a Survivor Series actively in play. So it'll be a bit too late for a preview. There are four matches currently announced, one more definitely happening, and one more which seems likely at this point. Now, Nick, I know there's something you want to talk about, something burning in your soul. Before we start, a, let's say, debate, maybe a heated debate that we had this time last week. So I'm just going to give you the reins, and then I'm going to tell you why you're wrong. Go for it. Well, I'm going to say a few things. First of all, why are you wearing a stupid red panda costume as I talk to you? Like, this is beneath my professional, um, oh, you're just ridiculous, and you put the hood back on. I just can't. That is just, just be- that is beneath the standards of PW Torch, um, for the record. Second of all, I want an apology. All of you people, you people listening, you know, my Aunt Vi, may she rest. She died in 99, but she she always had a saying when she didn't like something that someone did. You people, she used to always say. And you know what? I'm bringing out the Aunt Vi-ism. And that poor woman, she died on the on the porch of the house in Bound Brook. So you know it's serious when I start talking about her. I told you so. And you know, I know I'm not that type of person to say I told you so. But I told you so about Austin Theory. Now, here's the thing, Tom. All of you people out there on the Twitterverse – Right. And he's been buried. He's done. He's when Vince left, all his opportunities left. I warned you all and don't say you didn't hear it, that this was the start of a new day, a new a new era, if you would, a a stripping back of the silly and an embracement of the serious. What did we get this week? You may not have liked how it turned out necessarily in terms of like his actual performance or whatnot, but he was clearly presented as an elevated, more serious threat. To Seth Rollins and the entire roster. You cannot say that he wasn't. There is a implicit goofiness with the Money in the Bank briefcase, which nobody really wants to acknowledge. Because ultimately, it always turns out more interesting for the person holding it um, once it is cashed in. It was a redefining of the potential into an actual implementation of the serious. And I think that that is what works very well right now for the um, reintroduction and reinvention of Austin Theory. So all of you people out there who went from in one swing of a day saying he's he's done, it's buried, all that kind of stuff to now, look at him. Look how good. He does look good. And you know what? This is the start of a new day, and I predicted it. Thank you very much, Tom. I appreciate your time. Now let's start talking about Survivor Series. Nope. So I stand by it. I well, stand by what I mouth. said last week that Austin Fury has been buried, but I also think it's been a necessary burial. The character that he had needed to be broken down, broken apart in some ways, and then rebuilt. Needed to happen. He was built on goofy ideals, the selfies, the Vince McMahon, the briefcase. It actually made sense to give him the briefcase, given that he was a little bit crazy with it. And that seemed to be what Vince McMahon was going for late on. Look at Otis. Similar situation. Given a briefcase, make some jokes about it. Big E would pop up every now and then and just make jokes about the briefcase. That goofiness, that comedy seems to be what the briefcase ended up being for. Now, for Austin Fury, as he was, that suited him perfectly. He was a goofy character. That character has picked up loss after loss after loss, has been destroyed by everybody, had a very rough time at WrestleMania. Essentially, this is predating Triple H. Austin Fury was a loser and that's okay 
there are winners and there are losers in wrestling. And this is a, a conversation I'm constantly having uh, on the live shows that in order for someone to win, someone else has to lose. Otherwise, what you get is protected finishes, 50-50 bookings, and just a lot of garbage, as it were, when it comes to the booking. I do think Austin Theory suffered a bit of a burial, and I think a rebuild is now on the cards. But I do think he's lower down the pecking order than he was when Vince McMahon was there. I definitely believe that, firmly. And that's what a burial is. It's not the end of someone's career. It's a reduction in their overall value. That's not a burial. Yeah, you're just redefining your your argument right there. You you think this is nice? I think this is terrible. What do you mean nice or terrible? Where's your where's your quantification? That's, 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 that's my new catchphrase, Tom. Don't stomp on it, uh, Tom. There's a difference between a de elevation or a de escalation and a burial. That was this was not a nope. burial. There isn't. Yeah, no, there actually inherently is. There isn't. What, a burial, a burial is means you're dead. You're dead like my aunt nope, Vi on Bound Brook. You want to talk true. about my aunt? You're going to talk about my blood like that. You're just opening She's that door dead. yourself. You want to talk. You literally brought this conversation on. You, Mr. Dead Man's Tie, are bringing this particular one home to roost. And no, it's not. There is not just buried or not buried. You can do damage to someone's character. I'm the one who's saying that there's not a over. difference between burial and burial. You're the one who's saying there's burial or no burial. No, I'm not. Then what are we In fighting no way I'm for? Saying that. I think you're just getting overexcited. Just take a breath. Listen to what I'm saying. Stop thinking about dead people. Okay. Come back to the moment. No, I, I think you're wrong about this. I think he there was an intentional stripping back of his character and that yes. w- included losses. That is not a burial, Tom. I do believe that did harm to his overall character presentation and ability so are you, to get over. But are you saying there was a burial to the man or the character? The character. Okay, well, then I can get I feel the character was buried in order to then rebuild a new one. Yes. Nikki Cross, I feel, in in a very similar situation. But I don't, I don't, well, I don't want to talk about Nikki Cross, but let's stick of focus on Austin Theory. I I can agree with that. What I'm saying is I don't think your opinion is the common accepted burial that people were talking about. They're not talking about the character, they're talking about the man. I agree when it comes to that. I I don't think my opinion here is the the consistent one from wrestling fans. But what I see most often, particularly on Twitterverse, is people who actually just don't seem to understand what burial does mean. Who've never spoken to wrestlers, who've never taken time to actually even just watch up, up, down, down videos and learn what Xavier Woods considers to be a burial. There are very different opinions between wrestlers and wrestling fans as to what each thing means. One of my favorite things, just literally from watching up, up, down, down as an example, you don't hear about face and heel, you hear about baby and heel. Little tiny things like that that you can pick up just in those moments that make you realize, hey, we don't really know all the things that a lot of fans seem to think that they know about everything that goes on in wrestling. Well, that might be true. I'm going to say this. You, you've, you've turned this around. You're putting a little bow on it. I think 90% of the, the listeners out here would have agreed with me in that. I don't think the use use the word burial for a character intentionally in the booking. I think that that would just be just how the, the the character is booked. I think people, when they attach burial, which you're invoking here as, as being used, is attached to the backstage person. And I think there are many different ways that one can be considered buried. The intention is is very clear. As long as the character, the personality has been defined down, has been devalued. There you go. That's a burial for me. Uh, okay. You think that's nice? Different scales, but. You think this is nice that this is the way you start off my Saturday morning? I woke up for you. I was you fighting on the this. streets of Morristown last you night. You opened this door once oh, again. Oh, uh, uh, I opened the door to be appreciated, not yelled at by someone in a red panda suit. Who... So to be clear, you do this show purely for appreciation. Well, yes, I do. <laughs> and you wonder why I have to speak so softly when I'm introducing you. You wonder how, why I have to deal with ego as producer. Here. I think this is terrible. Just quickly before moving on, I do feel looking at Carrying Cross, there's another example of a similar burial. The the character, the personality has been heavily devalued. Nikki Cross, I think the rebuild is is ongoing. I do have a concern though about the way the characters are being rebuilt at the moment. So Austin Theory became new and vicious. Nikki Cross has become new and vicious. The Viking Raiders became a new vicious version of their new vicious version. It's become a thing in the WWE over the last few years that a character rebuild is basically just, now I'm angry. And that's kind of it. 
I want a lot more from characters. Austin Fury is a very good character actor. I'd be disappointed if we don't get to at least see some of that personally. So how would you book him? Like what 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 type of character would you bring out in him? Because I struggle with that. I, you know, it's interesting when I saw him going on his angry, new, vicious tear at the end. I kind of thought, so, OK, so just growing a beard does not a change make in terms True. of drastically uh, of someone his age, his body type, everything. I think that at this point, thank we, he's fine with the name we're, that we've got, yeah. got it back. We're good with that. I do think um, there is something about the the actual costuming that I think needs to be evaluated. And I think even the entrance. So I like a town down, you know, I was playing that in my office the other day, Tom, with the a and the down, you know, the whole thing. But, um, you know, I think at this point it's, it's impossible not to look at Austin theory and see obviously long range potential, right? He looks the part. And I think he performs to the part. I think his acting is, is quite good. You know, all things considered, it's certainly not bad by any means. And he's still young and he's got a tremendous future ahead of him. I just, you know, I still think it's going to be a while before he truly, as a as a man, figures out who he is. Because ultimately, when you're that young, it's very hard to have a defined character and and to really know who you're going to be in, in a way that could last 20 years if you want to be in the industry that long. Um, but what do you see for him? I mean, it, it, I think you're right in that the the anger and the the viciousness can only get you so far. But where does it land? So I personally would have him reuniting with the way I believe I've mentioned this previously. Yeah, I just times. feel that faction just suits the character that he had and the character that he's going towards now with this extra intensity. I do think he's got a he's got a while before he's going to be main event level, and that's okay. We don't need to push people too far and too fast. I'd let him find himself a little bit before we get to that spot. But I think he's got a lot of very good years ahead of him. I would still have him with this viciousness, but I'd have him patting himself on the back quite a lot so he can definitely deliver but maybe he gets a bit too into himself for doing so that's how i personally would go there yeah you ever see the movie jerry Maguire? yes kind of like the cuba gooding jr character and like he's overly cocky he was the um i guess i don't know why this is sticking out to me maybe not but he's like the former like next big thing who you know i don't know has like the to me the the big shot agent that's how i would kind of see him yes but yeah. who's still also not really on like a winning streak. And I, I, I told you, I think he needs a manager not to do the talking for him, but just as a compliment, a bookend compliment, especially in an era where so many people have friends and backup. Mm -hmm. I think he would uh, he would serve very well. And listen, I'm not a big fan of when everyone suddenly goes to wants to change their character. Suddenly they wear beautifully tailored suits. I, I mean, it's, that's up there with the beard. Like it's we don't need to reinvent the Chris Jericho turn turn. Um, but I think something about I've said before about the MVP thing would work. I wouldn't pair him necessarily with a female act because they would uh, be able to resist the insinuations of coupledom there. So I don't know. I think I would like a, a you know, it, here's what I would have liked. What they are doing with Baron Corbin and JBL, but not that. Because I don't like that. I get what you mean. Someone to support him, a, a coach, yeah. as it were, and so on and so forth. I like what you've just suggested there with that particular comparison. I also like the idea that even before they pull the trigger for Austin Theory, he can be annoyed at wasting his potential. Like nobody else is annoyed at him wasting his potential, but he thinks he is by not already being champion. Yeah. I'd like that, that little bit of insecurity coming through. I feel that would help the character overall. You still think we're on a path with him eventually where he's fighting a John Cena at a SummerSlam or a WrestleMania or something like that? I mean, that is really my, my number one question is how far does this potential take him? I mean, Sure, maybe years down the line we see him as a world champion, but we're not clearly looking at the Universal Championship right now and how they're booking that. That's not just something they're passing around as they used to in the in the old days. Um, but talk to me about what you think the potential is for him to have a special attraction match. And really the implication there is just be someone that's you know backed and trusted at such a high level. I definitely think John Cena is a good shout and someone definitely worth mentioning. I think Logan Paul would definitely be someone to pair him up against just with the insinuation of the characters and the selfies and so on. I feel there's a logic there and also helping him get over. But I think if there's anyone who's historically been on a mission to get Austin Theory over, it's Seth. I know that's not as big a marquee match as a match against Edge, as a match against Cena, as a match against potentially Stone Cold. But for me, Seth's the guy who can take Austin Theory all the way to the next level, to the top level, to championships. I think Seth's the guy. 
Well, see, I would challenge you on that, Tom, and say this. I think it is. I think that is more important than a than a Steve Austin match, and and bigger than a Steve Austin match. And you know, here's why. When we look at people who've been made over the years, it's been attached to an active wrestler on the roster, dedicating a long program to them. Like, look at no further than Triple H and and Cactus Jack, really, and Mick Foley. Um, that is an example of someone who, you know, is there day in and day out, and that. That through that history, through that that constant presence on television, you know, a, a total elevation of someone occurs because it's a an evolution of the character. It's it's allowed time to breathe. I think now that we've leaned into, oh, if you're paired with a special attraction wrestler, then that should be special. Well, no, because people are still viewing it as what it is, a special attraction. Therefore, nobody really benefits from any of those things. Tom, we're doing well now, but let's take a shift to Survivor Series as I've taken the reins as the uh, the host of it. I'm just trying to get you all riled up. I was ready for it. I was, uh, I was along <laughs> for that ride. Well, we're going to keep going. We're, Survivor Series is coming up, and as you know, we record our shows on a Saturday. Um, so we are going to be looking ahead. There's still an entire week of WWE programming to determine whether or not there's going to be shifts to the card, matches added. I think there's potential there, and we'll we'll dive into that. But let's start at what is the story of the show, which is the return of War Games. You excited for War Games coming back? I am excited for War Games coming back. I very much enjoyed the NXT War Games matches in at least the juxtaposition and how they've been put together. Though I am a little bit, not all the War Games matches have been good. I do feel the one in which Rhea Ripley and I believe Mia Yim beat a whole team of four didn't really work in the favour of the team of four, especially with Shayna Baszler, for example, leading the other side. So I feel the booking occasionally leaves something to be desired, but this is a born spot fest. We've had quite a lot of it, and I'm worried that we've extreme rules just going, with Money in the Bank not too far in the distance, with Hell in a Cell uh, matches having happened recently. I do worry it sort of detracts a little bit from the overall majesty of War Games. I think we're getting a few too many cages and cells and gimmicks right now. War Games has a lot to live up to, and it's going to be tough to stand out. Hopefully they can do that, but I'm excited to see what they're trying. Are you team lid or no lid? I personally am team no lid, primarily because I... It's not really the same as like climbing out. I don't see any issue in climbing out of the war games as long as you have to finish in the match. I don't really see any issue there, but it just gives people a lot more opportunities to dive off things. So I'm happy with yeah. that. Yeah. Well, see, I, I'm actually team lid here. And I, I know that we, I think it's safe to say we're not going to be surprised by, you know, the, the, the lid being on this thing for, for war games. But, you know, there is something about, I liked the, the first the first reintroduction of war games in NXT. But once you saw it once, things started to becoming similar every single time. And like, why are there magically trash cans in every single version of this match? Why are there kendo sticks? Why are there tables? If, you know, to me, that's not what I attach war games to. I remember vividly, Tom, actually being on my um, cousin's floor watching, uh, in, we were in Florida, watching uh, this this extreme match. And it was like, I remember like, being young, going like, oh my gosh, I've never seen anything like this. Because I was a WWF kid. You know, you didn't see things that were presented with such an implication, I would say, of violence at that yeah. age. This was 1989 or so. I don't know what it was. And, you know, you would see the, the, the gore of it all and the person's face going up against that, that fence. Like the fence that we all have at our houses, which was different than the blue cage that I knew of from WWF. And thinking that was wild. I like the idea of it being presented more of a fight. That just works for me a little bit better than the uh, than the, the high spot fest off the top. And I think that that, you know, that that is special when you see it and it should be treated as special, not the commonplace. You know, every time we do war games, we expect all these things to happen. So, you know, to me, I think a cage should matter and a cage without a roof does not matter if you can just leave and exit and bring weapons and all that kind of stuff back in. So so there's that. But I guess here's the thing that I am most intrigued about. We're going to start with the, the, the men's war game uh, match, which is clearly, you know, it's obviously the bloodline at this point. And, and that last night on SmackDown, the, the conclusion of their opposing team came into fruition when we saw um, Brawling Brutes, as we like to call Fight Night over here, Drew McIntyre. And they were joined by a returning Kevin Owens, which I couldn't help but watch that and think, man, if this was the 90s, that pop would have been so much bigger for that entrance. But um where, is this the, the the right match to kick it back off with? I absolutely believe it is, yes. I think they've got the exact right combination, primarily because of what you've just said there about a fight. Now, admittedly, I think the women's match will be more of a spot fest. I think when Undisputed Era were involved in NXT, that was a spot fest. 
I think in many ways, the WWE brought in Hell in a Cell to compete with War Games, and that's where the, the fight is. So War Games will be more of a spot fest. But in the people in this match, I don't see that. You've got the bloodline. You've got Roman Reigns, who is a brawler, who's ground and pound, who likes to work from the top. You've admittedly got Sami Zayn, who's a bit more uh, athletic in that regard. You've got the Usos, who are going to be flying off the top, admittedly. But you've also got Solo Sokoa, and I feel Solo is going to be a real standout here because of his general enforcer vibe. He's there to hurt someone, and that's good for a match like this. On the other side, every single member of that team is a fighter, is a brawler, is there to just hurt people. You've got Sheamus and Drew McIntyre, who excel at hurting each other, now on the same side, looking to hurt Roman. And of course, Drew and Solo have been very much paired together in uh, in feud there. You've also got Kevin Owens, who's very inventive, very creative. He likes to build things. So likely he'll be a bit more spot fest. But for me, you've got the right elements for a real fight for a real throwback to the war games of that WCW era, you've got that there. It just depends who opens in the cage. So, well, who who do you think is going to be opening? I think it is either going to be, and uh, this is my second choice, as it were, but it's either going to be Solo and Drew, mm-hmm. if they just want to start it with a proper fight, or if they want to start it more as a spot fest, it'll be Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn. Oh, see, what's interesting there, I like your first option the best. I mean, that's definitely setting a tone for this thing moving forward, which I actually think is very important. But I am more leaning into, I think it's going to be a little bit more basic than that. I think it's going to be Jimmy Uso and Butch. I expected you to say Jay and Butch. Nope, nope. I think, I think, you know, first of all, I I still think there's a little bit of they don't want Jimmy to be too folded into the background. I still think that there's a, a loyalty there. I, I just I get that impression a little bit just watching the show. But I, I think so. He'll get a little bit of a spotlight time there. And I think they don't want to this is they don't need to be so explicit with the J being, you know, so so singled out, if you would. Um, OK, fair enough. So who do you have winning? I have the bloodline winning this one. Do you? I do. Even though I do feel that Sheamus versus Roman is where we're heading for either later on this year or Royal Rumble. Yeah. I and it would that. make sense for Sheamus to pin somebody. I just don't don't see Roman staying down. Let me ask you this. How familiar were you with um, WCW's war games by the end of the 90s? Or, you know, in retrospect, have you looked into that? Not too familiar. I've looked back into some of the matches. But uh, unfortunately, this is one of those where I was looking back and I was looking back at pace. Well, let me tell you why I ask you that specifically. There is a narrative, and I don't mean that in the negative narrative word of like being dismissive of of the perspective, but there is definitely a narrative on the PW Torch channels back, if you go back and look in the archives of 96, 97, 98, of how the NWO was presented in War Games and how ultimately this particular match was actually damaging to the faction of the NWO, because, you know, this is a chance for opportunity to be made to really show weakness in the dominant heel faction. And I think that WCW chose not to do that. They chose to spotlight war games as where the heels just continue to steamroll. There was the big Kurt, Kurt Henning um, heel turn that took place. And that was, you know, on Ric Flair after he'd just taken Arn Anderson's spot. That was seen as, Again, not the fight that people wanted. They wanted to see this and, and probably still do as in, in WWE um, terms now as the place where Bloodline gets some, gets, gets some, what, some of what they have coming to them. And you can – the good news about this match is you can achieve that without Roman himself losing, right? This isn't an elimination match. So I have the Bloodline losing. I think that that would be the, the right move. I feel, Tom, I'm, I'm going to say this. I think this is still the setting for the Jey Uso real Fisher being shown within the dynamic, like in a real, real way. And I think it's because Jay loses. I think that he is the person to take the loss. Um, I, I actually think it would be even more impactful if, you know, he is just, you know, in a submission move or, or something along the lines and is calling out for help and there's no one from the bloodline there. And eventually he has to tap. I mean, I think that that works for me, not some like slip on a banana peel kind of thing. I think it's, it's the one to watch. I, I don't feel like we're getting there though that quickly, which maybe makes it more of a surprise when it happens. And I also just want to say as an aside, didn't love him, him breaking again this week on, on SmackDown. I think it's, um, it's reductive of the moment. 
it is becoming a bit too common now. I enjoyed it the first time around, but I did long term see that it did harm the uh, the moment, and it seems to be harming it going forwards. I still kind of expect war games to end with Jey Uso being speared by Roman. Oh. Whether you call that tough love or whether you call that a kicking out is still to be seen. But I do think this is the one where Roman actually breaks on Jay. Wow, good. I know good it's call. been teased that Sammy would be the one being kicked out, but that is not the story that they seem to be telling. All right. You good to be staying with the cages and head to the women's cage Absolutely. match? Absolutely. Go right ahead. All right. Well, we have Team Bianca Belair versus Team Damage Control. Damage Control is going to be complemented by Nikki Cross, of course. And now Rhea Ripley was uh, announced this week. Team Bianca Belair, a little less uh, cohesive in terms of, uh, you know, having fully established teams. But you have Asuka, Alexa Bliss, now Mia Yim and an open spot. Tom, who do you have in that open spot, do you think? And also, how do you think the match has been built so far? The open spot has a couple of potential uh, possibilities there. There is an obvious Beth Phoenix in against Rhea Ripley to counter that particular threat. For example, Candice LeRae has previously teased being part of that team. I also think Liv Morgan would fit very well in the War Games dynamic, given the character that she's playing right now, who which is new and vicious compared to what she was previously. I just think that would suit the more hardcore style that she's going for. I'll say Liv. But it seems like Candice is the easy fallback option, personally. Yeah. As regards the match itself, I do think this is going to be a lot more spot fest. You've got Bianca Belair to show power. You've got EO Sky to fly. You're also looking to establish certain names. Rhea Ripley, I feel, will really show dominance here and be really treated as a dominant heel, as she has done previously. Mia Yim, I'm not really sure what to expect yet. I've not seen enough of her work. I also feel that Alexa Bliss and Asuka... I'm interested to see what they do with them, to be honest, because neither of them are known for being particularly hardcore. And while Asuka is a bit of a bruiser, Alexa Bliss has never really been that. We could potentially see a twisted Bliss off somewhere high, but I do feel they're more sort of background in much the same way that I think Dakota Kai will be. That's not a bad thing. You need those background people like Solo Sokoa is going to be largely background, even though I feel he'll stand out. He'll have his moments where he jumps to it. Jimmy and Jay will likely be the background in the men's one. For the women's, I do feel there's a couple of people who will fade into the background here. Well, so let me ask you this. Who's going to start off the match and who's going to be the star of the match? So this is a tricky one. If we're talking about who's going to start off, logically, I'm putting Rhea Ripley in on the heel side. On the face side, I'm going Bianca herself. Mm. That just makes the most sense to me. Firstly, the pairing there. And also, Bianca on the side of the good guys. She'll want to go first. I like that. Who's going to be the star of the match? Who are we talking about afterwards? If we're talking about individuals, the way WWE has been booking, it's going to be Bianca. Because it's always been Bianca. Bianca is the one they're pushing the hardest. I feel this could be a breakout for Rhea Ripley. But I also feel, and this is probably the strongest part for me, Mia Yim has just returned to the company. They're going to want to show her off a bit. Yeah, I agree with that. I think, but I don't think those any of those are the answer. Uh, does that make sense? Uh, I think first of all, I was not impressed by Mia in this week's performance. I just, I think there, we're we're being uh, it, we're we're being expected to have a reaction to her and an appreciation for her that is quite frankly ridiculous for us to be expected to have. And I think that that just stands out. And I don't think she's a a performer or an actress nearly to the the level of of that kind of appreciation and respect yet. Right. Like, let, let's get there. I think Rhea Ripley, first of all, is almost seems so disconnected from the women's division at this point that she feels like a special occasion that she's in there. So I think that's good. I'm viewing this as a real opportunity for EO Sky, though. I think that, you know, the the situation presents itself beautifully for a, a glorious moonsault off the top of the cage, assuming that there is no no roof on there. And. I don't know. I think that she could really be someone who maybe if not the first person in there, I would have um, Dakota Kai as the first person from Team Damage Control in the ring. But I think Io Sky could be the the sleeper of this match. And I, I could almost see like the surprise fifth person not being announced till the very first the first entry for Team Bianca Belair. And I think it's more possible that it's a Candice LeRae. I if they are going to hold it as a surprise for that night, you almost anticipate someone more special like a Beth Phoenix. But if it's Beth Phoenix versus um, a Dakota Kai to start off, that that works just fine for me. I do have team damage control ultimately with the victory here. And, and I think it's an important victory that they need. I think you know this is similar to Judgment Day and conversations that we've had about how the factions should be booked in that 
They're really booked well from a character standpoint. And when you do that, you can absorb many losses. But there's a bridge too far when it comes to absorbing losses. And I think that this is a time where you can have a team like Damage Control show unity, whereas the other team doesn't have that. And in fact, you should be spotlighting that because when factions are together, they should matter because they have each other's back. And I think that this is a good launching point for the next stage of wherever we're going with Bailey eventually holding that championship, which hopefully is the plan. But I think that this is... This is the match where we do that. This is the match where I feel Bailey should definitively pin Bianca Belair to end the match. I do have damage control winning. With the Royal Rumble coming up, this is a perfect opportunity for people to state their credentials a little bit. Rhea Ripley, for example, could definitely tease a possible feud between her and Bianca leading into WrestleMania. I feel Dakota Kai Io Sky could also potentially state credentials, even though I don't see them picking up the win. I agree with you that Bailey pinning Bianca should be the moment that we get here. You have this level of carnage required, but it does mean that there's a stronger chance of getting a continuation of Bailey versus Bianca. And I just don't feel Bailey's had the rub of the green so far. They may be moving on from it, they may, they may not, but they have several weeks now, about two months until the Royal Rumble between Survivor Series and then. They need something to tide them over. A continuation with Bailey makes the most sense for me. Did you say the rub of the green? Yes. I never heard that expression, but we're going to stick to talking about green because it's Shotzi versus Ronda Rousey. Oh, well done. You like that. Oh, you like that. You. I had to make sure I heard you right before I made the transition. That, that. So here's a question I have here. We're sticking with the women's division, obviously. Shotzi versus Ronda. Ronda, the reigning SmackDown women's champion. Tom, my first question for you is, does this match matter? Not at all. Not in the slightest. Shotzi got a win over Shayna Baszler because of distraction from Raquel Rodriguez on SmackDown to sort of help elevate her. She's still nowhere close to Ronda's level. If Liv Morgan wasn't even close to Ronda's level, which we've been very much shown she is not, then Shotzi doesn't stand much of a chance. I think it's so odd that this match exists on the card. So I hope I hope that there's a level of intention there and not just we, we want to get use out of Ronda and we also don't want her in the actual War Games match. You know, there, I, I was more hopeful for the long range potential of this being a, um, you know, starting ground for a some kind of opportunity involving Shayna Baszler. I'm less convinced of that week in, week out, as now it appears she's just going to be a side piece to Ronda Rousey rather than a, a showcase addition to her act. I, I am guessing that this isn't going to be going any anywhere fast, but I think that this placement on this card, which is really, you know, really pr prime placement. I mean, there's not that many matches here overall that maybe there's a planned angle afterwards. That wouldn't necessarily surprise me if there was a, a um, showdown involving Ronda Rousey and I don't know, or returning, returning Becky Lynch or someone afterwards. Um, I think this the setting here is is prime for that. So I'm guessing you have a, a clear Rondo victory, clean cut, boom, bang, boom. Pretty much exactly that, yeah. Not even distraction involved. I think Shayna Baszler will be there and just be a bit menacing, but it will be a clean win as best you can for Ronda. I think the idea here is to try and help elevate some of the people on the SmackDown women's division because at the moment we have Ronda, a big drop to live, and then a big drop to everybody else. They do need to even out a little bit more. As regards Shayna, I still think it's possible we end up with a tag team or a feud between the two, a tag team at least for now. But it does feel like she's there to do the physical stuff so that Ronda doesn't have to. Gotcha. Well, here's what I have. I have the same. I think it's a clear, clean-cut victory for Ronda Rousey. And I think it concludes with either returning Becky Lynch or Charlotte Flair or both to end the segment. How about that one? Charlotte Flair, I feel, is more likely. I wouldn't hate that. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, remember, I said both. That's all I'm going to say. Let's head to another match that's on the card. I think one that we're both going to be quite excited for. Tom, you excited for? You know what you know I'm going to say? I, I think so. You're in a panda suit. Get excited. Tom, we have AJ Styles versus Finn Balor. This is in many ways, you know, one of those matches that because these both superstars are, are so present week in, week out, you forget this is a dream match every time it happens. True. Tom, talk to me about the leader of the OC versus the leader of Judgment Day. Are you excited for this one? And who do you have? I'm excited for this one, but not as excited as I could be because of the amount of overbooking that's guaranteed to be involved. We have the OC at ringside, supposedly Mia Yim, which is going to be after a War Games match, so I don't really see that one. We have Judgment Day at ringside, supposedly with Rhea Ripley, but she's just been in a War Games match, so I don't know if I see that one. 
it just feels like it's going to be a little bit more carnage than I personally like. We've got Damien and Dominic, we've got Carl Anderson and Luke Gallows. We've got a lot happening. That said, there is a little bit of additional tension if you look back into individual history. Finn Balor, of course, was the original leader of the Bullet Club, which featured Carl Anderson and Luke Gallows. There is a, there a particular possibility there that I would like about a potential changing of the guard in that regard. Judgment Day in that way would be too big for me. I wouldn't necessarily like it beyond this one match, but I would like it in this one match. AJ Styles took over as the second leader of the Bullet Club, so it is basically first leader versus second before you get to your Kenny Omegas, your Jay Whites, and so on and so forth. There is a lot of history there. They've only really wrestled properly once, and that was as a replacement for Sister Abigail versus the Demon King at TLC, I believe, 2018. That sounds right, yeah. Which did us a favor in many, many ways. AJ Styles versus Finn Balor should be fun. They fight in very similar styles. They fight at an extremely high tempo. I want to expect good things. But unfortunately, because of the amount of people on the outside, the amount of carnage and fighting there's going to be, I just don't think we're going to get what we're really after. Yeah, I could see that. I, I almost, this is a case where as much as I think the quality of the match is going to be good, I almost would have preferred a traditional Survivor Series match here, elimination style with these, with everybody involved. You know, as you were listing out all of the the wrestlers who were going to be at ringside, I couldn't help but actually think like that. Actually, the potential is actually there for something. And you know, would, would it would it shock me if we had an on the fly call to, I want to see you in here as a Survivor Series match? You know, that wouldn't shock me, quite frankly. Yeah. But the potential is there still for for a great match. I still think this is. This is another situation where I think we were ripe for a big victory for Finn Balor. I think he needs it. I think um, he would benefit from it, I should say. And in terms of, again, reinforcing Judgment Day as a real backbone act on on Raw and, and WWE as a total. Um, I think Finn also should be rewarded in some way. I think he's been doing some of the, the my favorite work of his entire WWE career in this act. And he made good on a situation which at the very beginning wasn't looking too good. So is that where you land as well with this? Pretty much, yeah. I do feel that uh, the way WWE are putting together their factions at the moment, the leader is tough, the leader is strong. The other two tend to lose fights. Fight Night, Imperium, Judgment Day. AJ Styles is OC in many ways, the bloodline at times when it was just the Usos and Roman. Damage control, that's how they're putting these teams together. For me, Finn Balor has been the winner of Judgment Day, whereas AJ Styles has been up and down. He's had a hell of a year, AJ Styles. He's been in some big marquee matches, but he's been losing a lot of big ones. He's AJ Styles, so he'll recover well enough. For me, Finn Balor's the one who benefits the most from the win here. And also, this story looks like it's never going to end. Yeah. If AJ wins, the story ends. So I see Finn Balor winning. Let me ask you this: In the was it we're at year six or seven, almost heading into with AJ Styles being in WWE. Where do you think this year falls in that? If you were to rank each year, somewhere in the top, middle, or bottom? Probably in the bottom, but that's not, not necessarily a bad thing. He's had sure. some extremely good years. This year's mostly been about giving back to other people. I'm absolutely fine with that. Though I will say the people he's worked with, Finn Balor, Edge. They wouldn't necessarily benefit that much from the giving back. But then you've got people like Dominic Mysterio, Damian Priest. They are benefiting massively from this association. I could see that. I think the visual still of the OC doesn't work for me, though. I think that that seems beneath. You know, that's just that's my opinion. I also think that there is a direct correlation between Judgment Day and Damage Control as both serving the same purpose in the various divisions. Yeah. And I think that. That works, you know, quite well. Tom, this show is ripe for more matches to be added to it. Prior to the show, we were chatting about it. You thought there was a possibility for Intercontinental or United States or both um, championship match to be added here. Which which of those potentials is most interesting to you? A Gunther um, defense or a Seth Rollins, Seth Rollins defense? As much as I'm a big fan of Seth Rollins, I do think the Gunther match that's potentially uh, being put together is more exciting. When you look at the World Cup, on Fox bracket that they're pushing, the teams that we have involved. We have Butch versus Legado del Fantasma. We have Ricochet versus Braun Strowman. It seems pretty obvious where we're heading, especially after SmackDown last night, where Gunter was, and I really don't like saying this, running away from Braun mm. Strowman. We've been celebrating how much more human and beatable Braun Strowman has been. But when he completely no-sold that first chop, I'm not happy with that. I'm very glad he sold the second one a lot better. He did seem to actually 
take the second one and sell it more. But Gunter running away is just completely wrong as a character that they have established. They are changing one character to suit Braun Strowman, who they've just changed again from being the guy who isn't quite as unbeatable as he used to be. I do think if we get the match, it'll be a Gunter win. I do think Braun Strowman has a pretty big loss ahead of him in order to sort of quantify him in that regard. I don't want to see Gunter running, but I think Gunter will cave Braun's chest in with some of those chops. No, I, I can't disagree with you. Wouldn't it have been so much more impactful if when he threw that chop, Strowman dropped to one knee and then came right back up. But just that, that visual of like, oh, he just absorbed a hit would have really, really worked for me. Am I wrong into saying a week ago you were talking to me about Strowman defeating Gunther for the championship eventually? Eventually, yes. I just think it's far too soon to do so. I still kind of think we're going to see Drew McIntyre win the title at WrestleMania. But I do feel Strowman is being built towards something, but also Strowman is very much in the monsters division. Gunter can dip into that and then dip back out of it. That's the benefit that he has. Yeah, I think the challenge for me here is this is a convergence of priorities. And I don't think they need to be converging so fast. I think this is a self-imposed issue for WWE if it, if it doesn't turn out well. To me, the priority here is Gunther, I think, and not just himself, but the entire Imperium Act and really the Intercontinental Championship. That should be the priority for protection here. And if they're not going to do that, then the match should not happen. So the fact that it hasn't been announced um, seems good for me in terms of making sure that they want to kick the tires on this a bit to make sure that everything is ready if we're going to implement it. The problem for me here is I don't trust that I also have the same priority as the others who are heading into this match. There was a clear tell this week that Gunther was, um, I think, you know, weakened by that reaction, by the, the, the running around. If, in many ways, I thought that was the most memorable piece of SmackDown was actually yeah. seeing him um, running around. It looked, it looked goofy. And, you know, it was one of those moments where I actually thought, thank God. Thank God, Tom, that Vince McMahon is not backstage because he would have thought that was really good seeing Gunter run around. Tell me that the idea of, you know, like the big strong man goofily running around like it's a 1950s sitcom as it being scared of something wouldn't be something that would have, you know, gotten him a little excited, if you know what I mean. I cannot say otherwise in that one. Vince McMahon loves his traditional <laughs> big guy heels, all of whom are loud and bolshy, but also very cowardly. That's what Vince McMahon always likes to put together, with very few exceptions. Gunter, however, has defied all um, all boxing in. If you've looked at his work in NXT, his work on the indies, he doesn't have one dedicated finisher, which wasn't something Vince McMahon was a fan of, but something Triple H is bringing back. He wrestles in a style that isn't constantly one person on top, then the other person on top, then the other person on top, etc., which was the Vince McMahon style of, okay, your turn, your turn, your turn. Gunter defies the logic of Vince McMahon in that he was also not necessarily face or heel. He just came out there, put on the best wrestling match he could, and it was up to the fans what he was. That's how you get into those feuds with Sheamus, where you turn Sheamus face. That wasn't a face or a heel that stepped into that ring with him. That was just a very tough guy who was ready for a big fight. That's someone who gets over. That's someone who goes all the way. Vince McMahon's model of uh, making him a more of a cowardly heel that we saw when he first got called up wasn't working. And I feel Triple H made a choice here that was a detriment to his character. Well, let me tell you, I'm going to be lighting my manifestation candles that if this match actually takes place, that a Gunther victory is the result. Otherwise, Tom, I'm quitting the show. All will be forgiven with a gun to victory over Braun Strowman. If they are saving that big chopping the giant down moment for the pay-per-view, I'll be absolutely thrilled to see it. Yeah, me too. Well, we, as you know, as I've already stated, we are a week out from the show. Much can change. We are not going to continue to speculate on matches that haven't yet been announced. But for the most up-to-date predictions, you can join us next week here on the VIP Daily Cast, where we'll be addressing, you know, any further matches that were announced. But, Tom, there is still further information. We're talking about all that happened on SmackDown last night. Hard to, you know, walk away from SmackDown. We're talking about memorable moments and not talk about LA Knight and Bray Wyatt, which ultimately I felt like was the most interesting segment. You know, we've both been struggling with the Bray Wyatt character. I have to lead this conversation by saying, Tom, I'm an LA Knight fan after last night. I thought he did, I thought he did a great job. Now, it, last week on the call, I think I said, Something about the dangers of Bray Wyatt at the current state is best exemplified by the fact that he was outperformed by L.A. Knight. And I think 
you know, I still stand by that. I still think that actually is happening. But I guess I didn't realize the high quality of the work L.A. Knight had. That doesn't necessarily represent a, um, a reduction of Bray Wyatt as so much as it is. Oh, L.A. Knight is, is, as a surprise to me, self-disclosed, really a, a strong performer. I think um, we saw hints of that in Maximum Male Models, but this is a whole nother level. I thought he did a great job. Tell me about you're walking out of SmackDown thinking what? I'm walking out of SmackDown thinking exactly that. SmackDown was not um, particularly full of massive moments. They would they tend to be more by the numbers, as it were. But the draw segment between Bray Wyatt and LA Knight really, really stood out for a number of different reasons. We have been crying out for some advancement from Bray Wyatt. And that's what we saw. We really got to grip his character a bit more. An apology is out of character. Admittedly, a guy who's slowly losing his mind and he's going to be angry and get new and vicious. That is very Bray Wyatt. We've seen it in every incarnation. But what we haven't seen is this humility. What we would never see is the element of bargaining that took place here. He let LA Knight get a shot on him and he was still happy to offer a hand. That's not Bray Wyatt. That shows something new and something interesting. LA Knight, obviously a fantastic performer in this segment, particularly that he would get close enough but not too close. After that initial slap, he kept his distance. He was nervous, but still showed that confidence, still wasn't afraid. You see elements of when The Rock first started to get over as the people's champion, when he stepped up to The Undertaker and Kane to protect D'Lo Brown. A little tiny moment that doesn't get mentioned enough, because that's when people really started to get behind The Rock. This, for me, was that moment for LA Knight, when you realise that he is not afraid to step up, but he's also not stupid. And I do feel the uh, the good guys sometimes suffer from being a bit too stupid, getting a bit too close. LA Knight is a shrewd operator and he knew exactly what he was doing. Unfortunately, did not end up being the biggest benefit to him, given that he was buried under a pile of rubble, to be clear, buried under a pile of rubble there. But also I do feel this is a very good sign of things to come that uh, we maybe won't see in this incarnation of Bray Wyatt how everyone feuding with him ends up a little worse off. Well, you know, Tom, my takeaway is this is the night where the Bray Wyatt character went from previously being a monster movie with The Fiend being a slasher flick involving the new character, where the door opened, you saw the mask of him in the background. So this is this went from being poltergeist to being Scream. And that I actually, I think, is is it works. It works really, really well for me. I thought one thing when you called him a shrewd, uh, shrewd operator, is that what you called LA yeah. Knight? I thought he was that and a smooth performer. And I think one thing that I think really stood out to me was he never lost focus. You know, there's, there's something about the WWE promo style or just the performers in general when you're performing in front of live people where there's a um, immediate assessment on how they delivered a line. You can see them look to the crowd. You can see them try to remember the next line. There's like a sometimes a relaxing, like when you sometimes, one thing that resonates for me as a live performer is you can, one of the first tells on how you're gonna do is when you first, when you literally hear your voice. It, it, it indicates whether the microphone is working, it indicates just how you sound in any particular moment. Do I sound confident? Sometimes you just need to hear that first line to go like, okay, and we're off to the races. And I think you see that reflection back during a lot of promos, even of the, the main event level in WWE. This was different. This was someone who, from beginning to end, had a flow. Uh, he was, there was no worry about, am I going to remember my line? He knew what he was going to say because he was embodying the moment. And I think that was something that most um, stood out to me. I think you, I, I would have lost any bet in the world um, or you know, there's no amount of money that I could have uh, gambled to say that L.A. Knight was going to be the, the first person that was going to be standing opposite around Bray Wyatt right now. And it, it oddly works for me. I do think, I will say this, I do think it's reflective of the fact that there was no long-term established plan for Bray Wyatt, right? I think that's fair. Yeah. But it doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing. And I, if we're going to get high quality kind of things, talk to me about what you think about the comparison I'm putting forward about the horror movie. Is that where we're going with Bray Wyatt? I do think we're heading in that direction because we now have our first victim. Yeah. So you've established the monster at least a little bit. I still don't feel we've seen enough of the Uncle Howdy character to know whether that's 
a monster or whether it's just Bray when the mask's on, same as it was with The Fiend. I think there's more story to tell there. But I also think they've been smart in realising that the audience was getting bored. Yeah. There's only so much we can get. Don't give it all away. So I feel we've had the first act now. We're now being introduced to the victims. Let me ask you this. You've seen the new Scream from last year or this this year? I've not it seen it now. Do you mind if I make a comparison? I as a spoiler warning all over it. Spoiler warning. We're going to be talking about the Scream 2022. If you haven't seen it yet, go watch it. I believe it's on. Is it on Peacock? No, it's on Paramount Plus. That's that's where. Go go watch it. Um, OK, now we're going to go into it. I think that there's a transition that can be made to this character that fits how the new Scream has been done. And that it's a slasher movie that has victims from one actual killer, if you would. But there's a call to mind of um, one of the performers to, um, you ever see the original Scream? Yes. So the Billy Loomis character, who was one of the killers in the first one, returns after all these years, right? 20 some, 25 years. Is he the tall one or the short one? Uh, He's the one with the Johnny Depp hairdo. Gotcha. So uh, he comes back in uh, in a reflection in the mirror in a conversation with his what has been revealed to be his daughter. And that's how that character kind of comes back. He's not actually ever involved with any of the other other actors. There's the other characters. He stands as a um, just like I would say, like a moral ground, a moral, a moral uh, conversation point for one of the characters to work opposite of. If Uncle Howdy is going to serve that type of character, that works. I don't ever want to see Uncle Howdy in the ring. I don't ever want to see him interacting with anyone else besides Bray Wyatt or just having it in the promo world. I think there's a part where one of the things that worked really well with the Fiend character was literally the mask was done at such a high quality. Tom, if it was even a tinge less quality, it would have been cartoon, right? There's no way of bringing back, bringing Uncle Howdy out there with the, the makeup and all of that and almost like that looks kind of like the, the Wizard of Oz kind of costuming and not think that, you know, it, this is going to be, you know, a little goofy. So I think if he stands as someone who is, again, just someone who's in the head of Bray Wyatt, who almost like as if he's – Bray Wyatt is the only one who can actually see him and interact with him, even though we see him literally – I think that works as as, as some form of uh, character development there. But beyond that, I don't see it. That's exactly where I see this going. There is a lot of moving parts to introduce, and it's going to take a lot of time to get them through. You've not just got Bray Wyatt himself. You've got Uncle Howdy. You've got Uncle Harper. You have the Wyatt Six, all of whom were introduced at Extreme Rules, and we haven't seen anything of them since. You have a new va- a new variant, as it were, of The Fiend. We don't know how that's going to play out just yet, but we know the Fiend is actually going to have some sort of physical form. Bray Wyatt will not be playing all of these characters. He does have to establish victims. He has to establish allies. What I see, particularly when they they show Bray Wyatt up next or up Bray Wyatt now, during SmackDown last night, they showed one of those Bray Wyatt vignettes over Michael Cole speaking. That's something yeah. that I really spotted on, on SmackDown because they did it with backstage as well. Megan Moran trying to grab a cameraman to follow L.A. Knight. Kayla Braxton waiting at the curtain and saying, you ready? You ready for Braun Strowman to come through? Making that feel a bit more real. The Bray Wyatt world exists entirely separate to SmackDown and in many ways just takes over the moment. That's where I see from Uncle Howdy. I see Howdy being the devil on the shoulder. Uncle Harper, the other trademark that's been copyrighted, as the angel on the shoulder because of reference to Luke Harper. And I do see those being the influences on Bray because it is a constant for Bray Wyatt's character. Someone else is talking to him. That has always been the case. Sister Abigail, The Fiend, Matt Hardy at times. Bray Wyatt is not a leader. He is a follower. He needs people on his shoulder. He needs the voices in his head. And that's why he always went after Randy Orton. Well, it's going to be interesting to see where this goes. One constant with a horror movie is the first the first kill is always is always a good one in terms of being someone who feels, um, you know, it, it, it's a scene that usually is is really most impactful. And it is someone who is unexpected many times now, as laid out by the Scream franchise. And I think L.A. Knight served both of those roles to be both surprising and very, very good in the scene. So. Congratulations to LA Knight and Tom. That's all I got for you today. Do you have anything for me? I have absolutely nothing more for you. I mean, you've uh, 
you've done a sterling job there. You just forgot to wrap us up. No, no, no. Oh, no. Oh no, I oh, haven't you, forgotten it. Oh, you have I was, something. I was actually being, you know what? I was actually being kind because I thought how nice it would be if a host of this show actually before wrapping up said to the guests, you know, is there anything else you would like to, to say? Because I don't get that. What I get is someone who decides when they're done that they're just going to call it. And imagine how I feel. Imagine how I feel. Tom, I feel fine, but you don't ask. That's what I'm going to say. You're not used to this whole being a producer thing, are you? We have a time limit. I've got to tell you, I'm very tired. This was exhausting. You, well, it's not just this. I mean, you've had a big night, haven't you? Bigger than you know. <laughs> I, I'm All not right. aware of the size. What can I say? Oh, God. Oh, God. It was that. that stop. That is ridiculous. That's not what I was thinking of. But you, okay. And folks, we're going to wrap up there. Thank you for joining us here for Nick and Tom's Intercontinental Venture on the PW Torch Daily Cast and um, the VIP site where we are ad free. Obviously, go VIP if you have not already done so. Tom, where can people find you? You can find me on Twitter until Twitter eventually explodes at twitter.com forward slash Tom Collihue. I'll be moving most of my work over onto YouTube, which is youtube.com slash at Tom Collihue. We're going to be using the community page for posts. There's more shorts now. There's a lot going on there. I'd like you to check out. And if you had been tuning into the YouTube and seen Tom's spoiler warning show, you would have known in advance that uh, Kevin Owens was going to be joining the the men's uh, War Games match. And you wouldn't have been surprised, I should say that. And you would have known before others and uh, against other people's predictions that that was going to be the case. So, Tom, well done on that on that um, call you had over there. Thank you, Kyle. You, you can find me on Twitter at Nicholas Barbati, N-I-C-H-O-L-A-S-B-A-R-B-A-T-I. -A -A Actually, you know what? Find me on Venmo. That, if you guys really want me, show me the cash. I mean, go VIP. Tom, that's all for today. I'll see you next Saturday. Well, just before you wrap up, though, I just want to start by saying one thing I really need to say is how proud of you I am for what you've just done there. Just taking over, really making that your own, showing your own individual personality. I just want to share some love and some affection 